in organic synthesis you very often want to combine two different fragments either through a single bond or through a double bond. In today's lecture we will look at options where we can combine two organic fragments through a carbon carbon single bond. In fact, the problem is so important that a solution to this problem was awarded the Nobel Prize in 2010. At least some of the processes which brought about carbon carbon single bond coupling in a very interesting and novel way. Now, the three people who won the Nobel Prize are Heck, Suzuki and Negishi, but there are many, many more who have contributed to this area and uh, we will look at time permitting, we will look at some of the processes which are useful in bringing about a carbon carbon single bond coupling and uh, we will start with some of the examples where these have been used. Here I have shown for you on the screen three different naturally occurring molecules. These molecules are important as drugs, they have been useful for the treatment of various diseases and surprisingly the synthesis of these molecules in the laboratory so that they can be synthesized readily and administered to patients is critically dependent on some carbon carbon bond forming reactions and these re, uh, these carbon carbon bonds are shown in red in these molecules and you can see that if one develops interesting methods or green methods to couple these systems together efficiently, you would have achieved the goal of the uh, goal which is in this case the synthesis of the molecule. So, the problem essentially boils down to making a carbon carbon coupling reaction and it can be generalized to say that there can be two different ways. You either couple them through a double bond or a single bond and today's lecture as I said it is for single bond coupling and you can couple them when they are two radicals. This would if the two fragments are two radicals, they would lead to indiscriminate coupling reactions where there will be homocoupling and heterocoupling of the fragments. You can make this more specific by combining a cation and an anion, in which case the cation will react only with the anion and not with itself. So, homocoupling would be avoided in this process. You can also have some metathetical reactions, a single bond metathesis reaction and this is something which would uh, be valuable and we will consider this a little later. So, let us take a look at some carbon carbon bond coupling reactions. The first person who systematically examined this process is Negishi and so this coupling matrix that I have written for you is the matrix that was originally de defined or uh, written down by Negishi and he says that this is the way in which he systematically approached the problem. He took two fragments and for the convenience we have written it in such a way that the if you have an alkyl fragment and that is um, uh, R C H 2 X which is functionalized. You can think of a metal fragment which can be generated from the same R C H 2 X in which case it will be R C H 2 M Y. Coupling of these two fragments would then lead to a molecule R dash CH2 CH2 R and that would be in this product cell. So, similarly you can couple two allylic fragments and that would give you this. You can also couple the allylic fragment with the alkyl fragment in which case we would write the product in the cell which is indicated here. So, you can have a matrix of coupling uh, reactions and this would be useful for making biarrails and these are indicated here and uh, you can also couple alkynes, alkenyl species. So, R C triple bond C and this would give you uh, conjugated triple bond C coupled products as we have written here R C triple bond C, C triple bond C and R dashed. So, let us do that again. So, you can have 
R C triple bond C C triple bond C and R dashed. So, you can imagine all the products written down in this matrix and uh, these will have to be coupled using various metals. Let us back up a little bit and talk about the historical development of this uh, process. It was not Negishi who originally developed carbon carbon bond coupling processes. It was in fact, a problem that has been tackled for a long time. There are reactions where Grignard reagents have been coupled together. Uh, they would be oxidized with copper, uh, copper 2 plus salt. There is this Karash coupling and the situation really became or the problem was taken up more seriously after Heck found out that palladium was able to carry out some very interesting reactions. At the same time, Tamura and Kochi uh, have looked at copper cop cuprate couplings and these are also uh, important, but uh, it was the work done by Kumada and Kuruyu with nickel based coupling reactions that caught the attention of uh, Negishi. And Negishi uh, took that reaction and started investigating or developing uh, that reaction in greater detail. The original observation at the time or the turn of the birth of organometallic chemistry in the 19 late 1950s or the early 1960s was the observation made by Heck. He observed that if you took finely powdered palladium, finely divided palladium, if you generate the reactive form of palladium and react it with an allyl or with a vinyl bromide, you could in fact generate a palladium organopalladium compound, which reacted as if it had the palladium between the carbon bromine bond. And this compound could add on to olefins in order to generate uh, organopalladium species, which I have pictured for you here. Simply put, you have a sigma carbon, uh, sigma carbon palladium bond, which now adds on to the double bond and that is how you would get this intermediate. And because this intermediate has got this hydrogen here, which can be eliminated in the presence of a base like triethylamine, you would eliminate and form these diolefins. So, if you took a vinyl compound, you would end up with a uh, diolefin. Essentially, you have in the process, you have eliminated a molecule of HBr from these two species together in the presence of palladium, in the presence of finely divided palladium. So, the what is pictured here is a stoichiometric reaction. And the question that we can ask now in uh, hindsight is that was that palladium that was used by Heck a nano palladium? Now, there is a lot of interest in nanocatalysis and it is possible that the palladium that was used by Heck was in fact in the nano regime in terms of size. But uh, whatever it may be, it Heck's original contribution in this at this critical junc juncture was the fact that he converted this reaction to a catalytic reaction. This original reaction that I described to you was done in a stoichiometric fashion. Now, he found out that if you use palladium acetate and a phosphine in the presence of a base like triethylamine, you can in fact couple the vinyl bromide that we have here. These two species can be coupled to give you, if you couple it on both ends of this triene, this is the triene and if you couple it both ends, you would get this molecule. <coughs> So, you can couple both ends of this triene to get this rather complex um, pentaene. But notice that I have deliberately written this reaction in such a way that this particular coupling has been done in a trans fashion. This, this carbon carbon bond has been formed in a trans fashion, whereas this carbon carbon bond has been formed in a cis fashion. So, it is possible using the Heck reaction to 
form both trans and cis uh, couplings. And this is in fact a disadvantage. Very often you would get mostly the trans compound. That is the thermodynamically most stable compound and that is what you would isolate in the reaction mixture. But at the same time, this is a disadvantage for the reaction. So, in the general form, if you write out all the substrates that are capable of undergoing the Heck reaction, here are the uh, compounds that have been used. You have R x and uh, olefin and the R can be either a aryl, vinyl or an alkyl compound. So, all of them are capable of forming the palladium, uh, palladium alkyl species or palladium aryl or vinyl species and these add on to the olefin in such a way that you form a substituted olefin. Notice here that the substituted olefin, I have written it in the trans form in this case also, but the other product should also be written. Now, it turns out that because you are eliminating a molecule of H x, you should have another, another atom or another hydrogen atom present on this olefin. Only then you would end up with the Heck reaction. So, the X group itself can be a halide or a triflate. It only has to be a good leaving group, which can add on to the palladium to form the organopalladium species that we talked about. So, palladium can then be made into a catalytic. This reaction can be made into a, ca a catalytic reaction in the presence of phosphines. And that was again found out that if you have hindered phosphines, then they are good ligands, then they turn out to carry out the reaction more efficiently. Similarly, if you have tertiary amines, uh, they are the best in order to remove this acid that is formed. The acid that is formed can be removed uh, readily and efficiently if you have a tertiary amine. So, let us take a look at the mechanistic aspects of this reaction now. This is the uh, familiar catalytic cycle that is written for a Heck reaction. Initially, you have the palladium 0 species, which in uh, in in the reactive form would react with an alkyl halide or a vinyl halide or an aryl halide and undergo oxidative addition. The number of ligands that we have specified here can go from n to n minus 1 during this process. Uh, it can also remain the same or it could lose more ligands uh, as the reaction proceeds. So, here I have carried out oxidative addition. And this oxidative addition gives you now a palladium 2 species. And this palladium 2 species coordinates to the olefin and you end up with a vinyl species or an alkyl species, which is adjacent to an olefin. So, this can now carry out an insertion reaction and in such a way that you end up with an alkyl organopalladium complex which is pictured here and uh, such that you this insertion reaction gives you the two R groups attached to this vinyl group that we or the olefin that we started out with. And you should have this hydrogen in the carbon which is away from the olefin carbon which takes on the R dashed. So, uh, so now you have you have two hydrogens on the olefin and one of them can be eliminated. And it is in general the hydrogen which is uh, which is in the beta position next to the palladium. So, now if you eliminate H and X, the two atoms which are um, rounded off. So, you could end up with a palladium H X species which would rapidly eliminate palladium. This is also palladium 2 you have only carried out a migratory insertion and a deinsertion. So, this is a deinsertion step in which the olefin which was initially added on had one R group and the olefin that is deinserted has got two R groups. And you have only added and subtracted a you have added a vinyl group or an alkyl group and you have subtracted a uh, uh, H x group. So, that you end up with a palladium 2 species and this palladium 2 species 
loses H x in a reductive elimination. This is a reductive elimination step and that gives you back palladium 0. So, the cycle is completed and you end up with a palladium 0 compound. This is stabilized again with ligands such as triphenylphosphine or trialkylphosphines. Now, this whole catalytic cycle is efficiently carried out only by palladium and that is the uniqueness of palladium. No other metal has been able to supplant palladium in this whole process. And there are limits to this reaction. X has to be a good leaving group which is obvious because if you want to have a oxidative addition then the rate would become rate the first step would become extremely rate limiting if X is not a good leaving group. And the alkene as I mentioned because you eliminate H X it should have a hydrogen and the olefin that you originally carry out the heck reaction with should be reasonably sterically free. If it is overcrowded with say three, three alkyl groups on the olefin then the reaction becomes extremely sluggish. In fact, you may not get a heck reaction at all if you have all three positions on the alkene which are, sub, are substitute, which are substituted by alkyl groups or vinyl groups. So, you need a minimum of one hydrogen that is technically true, but more hydrogens on the olefin the better it is. So, now you have the, uh, the limits to the reaction defined. You also have one very important uh, limit and that is the fact that the stereochemistry of the final product is not fixed and you can have both cis and trans products which are only the trans product is given here because that is very often the major product which is formed and that is why this reaction is still a useful reaction. You can have a carbon carbon coupling very efficient carbon carbon coupling which is useful. So, uh, here I have uh, for you the uh, uh, taxol synthesis which utilizes the heck reaction and um, you will notice that the carbon carbon bond which is formed um, indicated in red and the leaving group is a triflate and that is what I am circling in, uh, in uh, circling in the original molecule and the and the height and the place where it is adding on is the, the, the vinyl position that you are adding it on to is right here and that gives you because of the ring size you, it gives you a single product and that becomes a key step in the uh, taxol synthesis in one of the synthesis that utilizes the heck reaction. So, you can see that the heck reaction has been a useful reaction and at this time around late 1960s Negishi started investigating the coupling matrix which I talked about earlier and his uh, investigation was a fairly systematic investigation and he found that if you combine two different metals palladium as a catalyst and a stoichiometric amount of uh, of a molecule which is indicated in this column if you have a stoichiometric amount of this metal alkyl and palladium as a catalyst you can carry out a variety of reactions very easily in fact in his early uh, in the early stages he had investigated quite a few of the metals but then he found that zinc was a unique metal and zinc was unique and it was good because uh, zinc had the capability or the capacity to do reaction stereo specifically and he claims that that is uh, a key factor which makes the negishi coupling in fact one of the best couplings that is known in the literature so the negishi coupling which uh, was which was mostly developed and uh, popularized by negishi involves a zinc alkyl zinc organo zinc compound uh, which is reacted with an organo halide and this leads to a coupling reaction where x z and y is eliminated so x z and y is eliminated in this process and you have palladium only in catalytic amounts but we should note at this point that the organo zinc species that he utilizes 
is very often synthesized through uh, organolithium species. So, first you have to make a reactive lithium species and then the R L I is converted or is, is transferred to the zinc using zinc chloride to R Z N C L. This is in fact, the most efficient way of carrying out the Negeshi coupling. So, let us take a look at the mechanism of the Negeshi coupling now it uh, and let us look at the differences between the Negeshi coupling and the Heck coupling. The first step is identical. What you are doing is carrying out uh, oxidative addition between an R dash x to palladium, so that you get a palladium 2 species. So, this is the oxidative uh, uh, addition and then you have a palladium x bond. This is the palladium x bond, which I am marking for you in bold and red color and this palladium x bond can be converted into a palladium R bond where the R is coming from zinc. So, if I have a zinc uh, coordinated or a zinc alkyl or an aryl, this aryl can be transferred to the palladium and M x can be eliminated. So, you eliminate M x and generate, now you generate a diorganopalladium complex and this diorganopalladium species is a capable of undergoing reductive elimination. So, that you end up with a palladium 0 species and the coupled product and notice that you do not form, you do not have a migratory insertion reaction. The insertion reaction was the one which was a key step in the Heck reaction. Here you carry out a transmetallation reaction, which involves conversion of a palladium X bond to a palladium R bond. And so, the nature of the metal, which is indicated by R m is crucial in how this whole reaction proceeds. And Negishi popularized the zinc version of this reaction. And later on, we will see that Suzuki, who popularized the uh, boron, where m is boron, boron variety of the reaction uh, is also a useful alternative. So, the generalized Negishi reaction in fact involves a whole range of aryl, vinyl or alkyl groups in either R x or R m. So, it is a extremely versatile reaction and the x group that you can use for the trans the oxidative addition can be again a halide or a triflate. As I mentioned earlier, that step is in fact common to both Heck reaction and the Negishi reaction and the Suzuki reaction as well. So, you just need a very good leaving group on the X group. Now, you need to do a transmetallation and the transmetallation can be done with uh, zinc Z n y and that is what is given here as a generalized, generalized Negishi reaction. Later on, we will see that B Z 2 or, uh, or boron with two electronegative groups is what was developed by Suzuki. To give credit to Negishi, in fact, Negishi was the first one who reported the boron reaction also. He had tested the boron, but it was popularized and made more useful by Suzuki where by the numerous examples that he demonstrated later on. So, the it is interesting that uh, Negishi has in fact written uh, a historical introduction to this palladium catalyzed cross coupling reaction. And uh, in this paper, which was published in Journal of Organometallic Chemistry, he describes the development of the palladium catalyzed cross coupling reactions. And he notes that zinc, aluminum and zirconium and uh, magnesium also were used extensively in the 1970s. And it was uh, later on, it was the uh, uh, tin, boron and silicon were in fact taking second place in the carbon-carbon coupling reactions. And it was Negishi's group which popularized in the 1980s, mostly the zinc catalyzed variety, which now holds one of the key, uh, key uh, ranks in the carbon-carbon coupling process. So, let us take a look at one of the applications of the Negishi uh, uh, reaction. Here, you have this uh, 
coupling between these two units. Let us. So, you can see that Z n C L i can be eliminated and you can have this key coupling reaction which leads to this natural product which is um, shown here. So, this is only possible because you can have a very clear stereospecific reaction between these two fragments and it can be accomplished by the Nagishi coupling very efficiently by simple palladium tetracus uh, triphenyl phosphine palladium. So, what was interesting is that many times you need uh, extremely active uh, catalyst for the Nagishi coupling cross coupling reaction and many people have come forward to design new catalysts for the Nagishi cross coupling. Because if you have an alkyl halide like an alkyl chloride, then the oxidative addition becomes more difficult and you need an active catalyst and it has been shown by people like Buchwald in this paper which is shown right here that you can have efficient coupling with hindered phosphines and the phosphine that he has developed recently is pictured here. This is a ligand which will which we will label which is which we will add to palladium 0. Palladium 0 itself in this particular instance is introduced conveniently in the form of a dibenzylidine acetone complex. Dibenzylidine acetone uh, complexes palladium and keeps it at palladium 0 and this is a convenient way to store palladium 0 and add it to the reaction mixture. So, now the ligand that is used is highly hindered and they have shown that you can even activate aryl chlorides which are reasonably unreactive under the normal uh, heck or the uh, Nagishi reaction conditions. And here you can see two very hindered molecules which are coming together and forming a new bond which we will highlight for you here. This is the new bond that is formed and you have eliminated zinc chloride from this reaction mixture efficiently at reasonably mild temperatures and this can be this can this is made possible only because you have this very hindered ligand. And in this reaction a variety of very different functional groups are tolerated. So, you can have a variety of groups which are present in the aryl moieties and ester alkoxy or even an amino substituent is to tolerated uh, in this whole process. So, this makes it a very extremely and versatile useful coupling process. It is interesting to see the ligand synthesis in this particular instance. It goes through a organolithium molecule and uh, what, uh, what transpires is that the lithium molecule uh, initially forms a uh, benzene and that intermediacy is through replacement of this bromine with a lithium and that is the exchange of a Br and a Li and it is the same molecule which adds on to the benzene which then gives you this coupled product. So, this addition would lead to addition of these two uh, molecules would give you a ph phosphine which uh, a phosphine which is extremely useful. So, let us take a look at the Suzuki coupling now. Uh, the Suzuki coupling as I mentioned earlier is a coupling between an alkyl halide and a boron compound and the alkyl halide oxidatively adds to the palladium and the boron is a transmetallating agent. And the scope of the reaction is given here. Once again, you need a good leaving group and that remains a constant uh, a consistently uh, that remains an essential component of this reaction and you need you can have alkyl, vinyl or aryl species, but the requirement for a base in this reaction which I have uh, shown here is uh, is also a key factor in this reaction. You need a base in order to carry out the whole reaction. Now, uh, a variety of 
examples are given in this uh, transparency. Once again, I have given you the coupling of two hindered arene molecules, which can be carried out by palladium 0 and um, a simple boronic acid, which uh, can be coupled. This is uh, this is an example which would couple uh, two different aryls to give you a bi aryl and this reaction is so efficient that it can couple naphthyl groups also. If you have these molecules are axially chiral around this bond and that is how you can make chiral compounds if you have a chiral ligand. So, um, let us take a look at the palladium catalyst and the uh, palladium let us take a look at a variety of Suzuki reactions, which are uh, which are possible. And in the presence of a palladium catalyst and a base, you can combine this whole set of molecules, which are listed on my left, two different molecules, uh, either a allyl, vinyl or an aryl halide can be combined with a variety of boron containing compounds. Now, Towards, uh, towards 2000 and so, it was possible to combine even <coughs> uh, alkynyl species with a vinyl species. And in, in 2005, it was possible to carry out the combination of a alkyl boron with an alkyl halide. And this was carried out by uh, Fu. This was done in 2005. So, um, let us take a look at the mechanism of the Suzuki reaction now. The Suzuki reaction is also very similar to the Negishi reaction. So, Suzuki and Negishi fall into the same category of reactions, where you have an oxidative addition to give you the palladium 2 species, which undergoes transmetallation. The transmetallation step is the one where you either use a zinc species in the case of Negishi and in the case of Suzuki, you use a boron containing compound. And the palladium 2 species diorganopalladium containing compound, where there are two carbon palladium bonds, um, this undergoes reductive elimination in order to give you the palladium 0 species. Now, it turns out that the variety of Suzuki couplings that can be carried out are fairly large. And so, you can form mostly aryl, aryl bonds that is what it is used for significantly. You can use a palladium 2 precursor or you can use a palladium 0 precursor. The precursor is uh, very often reduced in situ if it is palladium 2. So, the active form of the catalyst is still palladium 0, but you can use a phosphine which can reduce it in situ to palladium 0. Now, you can use bromides or iodides and iodides are very good for oxidative addition, but you can also use chlorides under some conditions. But under normal conditions or the Suzuki coupling, chlorides are extremely reluctant and they do not work, they are not suitable. If the ancillary ligand that you use that is the L group is extremely electron donating, then you can force the Suzuki coupling to uh, work and that has been carried out also by uh, by people like Greg Fu and Stephen Buchwald. Now, here is a key reaction in the in the synthesis of a drug molecule uh, dynamycin and this again has been carried out by a Suzuki coupling that has been uh, that has been done and in this case I am going to uh, mark it out for you again in a different color, so that you can see the bond that has been formed. Here is the boron containing compound and here is a triflate that was eliminated from using palladium to give you an oxidatively added intermediate and that couples with the arene to give you the key intermediate, which would then be converted into dynamice. So, all three coupling reactions, the Heck reaction, the Negishi reaction and the Suzuki coupling reaction have been used for the synthesis as key steps in the synthesis of a variety of 
organic dr drug molecules and so they have become extremely popular. And there are in fact similarities between the uh, between the three, but as I mentioned to you between the Negishi and the Suzuki there is very little difference. It is only the transmetallation reagent that becomes a different uh, that becomes different when you go from Negishi to Suzuki. For Negishi you use zinc for Suzuki you use the boron. So, as I was telling you in the introduction it is possible to you do the transmetallation with a wide range of substrates. So, after forming the palladium 2 oxidatively added product that product can transmetallate because it has a P D X bond and that transmetallation can be done with any um, electro positive element. And so, it, it just depends on what is available and here is a variant of this uh, two coupling reactions that we have talked about. And this is called a Hiyama reaction where you have a silicon substrate which does the transmetallation. Notice here that silicon has got three electronegative groups. So, these are not the ones which are transferred to the palladium. It is only the R group which is less electronegative that is the one which is transmetallated to the palladium and the X group from the palladium is transferred to the silicon. So, what would be eliminated is SiOBU thrice X and the X would come from the uh, group which was present on the aryl moiety which oxidatively added to palladium. So, here there is an interesting variation and that interesting variation is the fact that you can use tetrabutyl ammonium fluoride as an additive and that seems to uh, increase or accelerate the reaction. TBAF um, can also be used as the base for uh, removing the uh, compound that is formed. So, there is a there is another variant which is called the Stille reaction. The Stille reaction has also been an extremely popular variant of this type of reaction and again palladium and the phosphine are essential and it adds on to the vinyl or aryl halide and here you end up adding a tin compound which will transfer this R dash group on to the palladium. And once again you see that uh, this reaction is a small variation. You can accelerate this reaction using copper iodide. The, the base that can be used are simple metal salts which will uh, promote the removal of the tin from the reaction medium. So, the reaction proceeds in the forward direction. So, the Stille reaction was also developed around the same time, but still the Suzuki became a lot more popular because of its uh, uh, extensive use, uh, extensive tolerance of various functional groups and uh, its efficiency. Here is one more example which is using a Grignard reag reagent. The Grignard reagent is, uh, uh, is RMG, any RMGX and the only advantage of this reaction is that there is no uh, base that is required in this whole process. MGX2 is removed in this reaction and you can do the reaction completely um, uh, in the absence of the base. And if you have a base sensitive uh, reagent, then this would be a suitable way of carrying out this coupling reac reaction. And the reaction is usually carried out in toluene or dioxane. Um, another variant which is extremely popular is the Sonagashira reaction. The Sonagashira reaction varies in the fact that you can now use a alkenyl substrate and the alkenyl substrate just adds on exactly in the same fashion. You have removed an H x. So, you need a base. You have removed H x. So, you need a, a base and the base is very often a triethyl amine or a trialkyl amine uh, or uh, inorganic solid base like cesium carbonate. And uh, this leads to the formation of the coupled product in extremely uh, high yields and this is once again a good substitute for this uh, for the type of reactions that we have been 
uh, for the Negishi and this Stiller reaction that we have talked about. The Sonogashira reaction suffers from one drawback and that is the fact that it uh, there are situations where you can have homocoupling of two of two of the al alkenyl species can be homocoupled to give you the uh, dialkenyl species which is pictured here. So, this is a disadvantage and so one has to suppress that and usually the addition of copper uh, is, is supposedly to transfer the alkenyl substrate directly onto the palladium and so it uh, leads to uh, uh, leads to another complication which is the alkenyl species that is formed with copper can also do a coupling reaction and that gives you the dialkenyl species as well. So, you can see that the Sonogashira coupling although it is quite popular can lead to some complications depending on how reactive your organo, organo copper species is present or your organo palladium species is capable of doing the homocoupling reaction. But nevertheless, it can be used for coupling a reactive R x with the alkyne and, and with the elimination of H x you would lead to a new carbon uh, carbon bond between the alkyne species and the R x. So, I mentioned to you earlier that the Suzuki coupling is not efficient if you have uh, aryl chloride and it has been possible to use very electron deficient very efficient uh, electron uh, very electron donating trialkyl phosphines and when they are also sterically demanding which means if they are bulky trialkyl phosphines then they are very good and they can in fact activate aryl chlorides. This was a deficiency in the Suzuki coupling reaction that I mentioned, but it can be turned around and it would be possible to do this in the case of uh, phosphines which are electron donating. Now, the first step as I mentioned to you is an oxidative addition. So, if the metal center has got a, a greater amount of electron density, it would be possible to carry out the oxidative addition reaction. And usually the oxidative addition will become rate determining if the halide or the chloride or if the halide is reluctant to carry out oxidative addition. And one should also remember that the presence of a sterically demanding phosphine leads to a low coordinated species on the palladium. And the low coordinated species is the re is the advantage for carrying out uh, oxidative addition because oxidative addition usually requires a lower coordination number on the palladium 0. So, that is how it is possible to have very efficient Suzuki coupling uh, reactions and it has been applied for Suzuki coupling specifically with chiral ligands. We will meet these ligands later on also when we talk about chirality transfer. These are a variety of chiral ligands that are very popular in the literature and these ligands have been used for Suzuki coupling. And here are the ligands that are uh, pictured although they uh, it is difficult to put them on the same transparency. You can remember that BINAP which is a axially chiral molecule and extremely popular for chirality transfer has got two phosphorus atoms and the ferrocene based molecules which have got uh, which are also again axially chiral have got a uh, single phosphorus uh, ligand on the on the ferrocene moiety. So, these two are uh, extremely popular and they have been shown to carry out asymmetric Suzuki coupling and this Suzuki coupling can uh, can be done with enantiomeric excess which are fairly large. So, um, the advantage as I mentioned to you is the fact that you can carry out these reactions with uh, uh, unactivated aryl chlorides. So, here is another example and that example comes from the group of Gladys and they have carried out very efficient Suzuki coupling reactions, bi aryl coupling reactions using a uh, interesting concept and that interesting concept is the fact that if you have 
a very electron donating group on the phosphorus and that phosphorus will be able to give electron density to the palladium very efficiently. So, here is a phosphine which is attached to rhenium and the rhenium is, uh, is a coordinatively saturated and also electronically saturated center. So, because of uh, this you can transfer electron density to the phosphorus and the phosphorus in turn transfers electron density to the palladium and that makes this reaction very efficient uh, with 1 mole percent of palladium and with 4 percent 4 equivalents of the ligand with respect to palladium you can now carry out this biaryl coupling very efficiently. So, uh, the sc scope the importance of these reactions is the fact that you can have low metal loadings and here is another example where the phosphorus is coordinated to a D 10 system. So, this is a D 10 system which is uh, electron rich and this is attached to the phosphorus and that makes the coupling reaction very efficient and these can be done with low metal loadings. So, in up to now we have talked about a variety of reactions where palladium has been used as the key reaction for carrying out coupling. Now, in, in recent years in 2002, it has been shown by Monterio that it is possible to carry out this reaction efficiently with nickel chloride. O only disadvantage is that this reaction has to be done in the presence of an inorganic solid base and dioxane, but the advantage is the fact that you have simple nickel chloride as the starting material and the price difference between the nickel and the palladium would uh, is enormous and so it is possible to carry out these reactions very cheaply. It is exactly the same reaction as the Suzuki reaction and you can see here a variety of couplings that have been carried out. OTS is the leaving group and um, uh, you have carried out coupling between OTS and the boronic acid that we have here. The common uh, common boron containing compound that does the transmetallation is uh, the boronic acid and the coupling product is given here. You will notice once again that the yields are quite high and uh, the conditions are a little bit severe. You carry out the reaction at 130 degrees, but there are some advantages to this reaction because you can carry it out carry out the whole reaction with nickel. So, the mechanism of the Suzuki coupling with tosylates is probably going through a similar reaction. What we have is initially nickel 0, this is nickel 0 and uh, the nickel 0, this arrow should be pointing in this direction and um, so if you have a nickel 0 and uh, it oxidatively adds the tosylate oxidatively adds the tosylate to give you a nickel 2 species and this nickel 2 species transmetallates and now you have OTS which is transmetallating with uh, boronic acid. So, that you end up with again a nickel 2 species no change in the oxidation state only a transmetallation reaction has been carried out and reductive elimination in this step reductive elimination in this step gives you the nickel 0 species and the coupled product which is shown here. Here is the oxidative addition step. So, there are two key steps here you have nickel 0 going to nickel 2 and a transmetallation. So, the mechanism is very similar to the Suzuki uh, uh, coupling that we talked about. Only thing is now we are doing it with nickel, it's nickel which is a 3 D transition element. Now, let us take a look at um, these uh, uh, reactions which uh, we can do as a cross coupling with a variety of uh, uh, arenes. The reaction the yields are extremely good and uh, as I mentioned the only disadvantage seems to be the fact that you have to you have to carry out the reaction at a fairly high temperature. So, um, bi arils are synthesized readily using nickel catalyzed coupling and 
uh, in one advantage is that you can couple it, you can now combine it with a classical Suzuki reaction, because one reaction needs a higher temperature than the other. One can be done with a tosylate, the other one needs a bromide. So, here is a reaction where uh, a substrate which has got two leaving groups, one is a bromide and another is a tosylate. So, with the palladium, the bromide reacts ready, very readily and you can have the coupling reaction between a boronic acid, a substituted a methoxy substituted boronic acid and that gives you a single compound where the tosylate is left unreacted. So, here the tosylate has been uh, unreacted. You have a substrate which is capable of undergoing reaction on either end. Only the bromide has reacted with the palladium and with the nickel at a slightly um, harsher conditions, you can see that the coupling can be carried out in the trans position that is the tosylate now leaves and that gives you a, a 3 a tri aryl if you will and that has been done with an uh, overall efficiency of nearly 81 percent. So, that is an excellent uh, excellent transformation from the simple di substituted arene to give you a tri aryl molecule. So, many of these molecules have got um, phosphine attached to the uh, to the ferrocene and that again is probably because the ferrocene has got an 18 electron uh, ion center which is electron rich and that in turn can pump in electron density onto the phosphorus and that in turn can push it onto the palladium making the palladium more reactive. So, ferrocene or arene phosphines as I have uh, mentioned to you have been developed by Greg Fu and uh, this here is a chloride which uh, is usually unreactive under the reaction conditions with palladium and you cannot carry out this reaction this carbon carbon coupling reaction easily because you have to activate the chloride, but because the ligand that they are using is extremely electron rich with a ferrocene center, you are able to carry out this reaction efficiently and as much as 87 percent yield has been achieved in this reaction. So, let me now summarize what we have talked about today. What we have talked about is, is that a key reaction in organic synthesis. In many of the uh, drug molecules, you need to couple two different fragments so that in a convergent fashion you can synthesize a fairly complex molecule. And during this process, you either need to carry out carbon carbon coupling, a single bond coupling or a double bond coupling. And a transition metal turns out to be a key factor and uh, uh, so far there are very few reactions which will not use a transition metal for this key coupling reaction. And interestingly, palladium turns out to be a key element in many of these processes. So much so that a uh, chemical en engineering news article recently had the title, the most important element in organic chemistry is palladium.